Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, yes, I work for the Royal Commission on Ancient Monuments in Aberystwyth, uh, and privately I've uh, written a new book about hillforts in Wales, and I thought on the back of that I'd come along this afternoon uh, and look at some of the key themes and some of the key ideas that are coming out now uh, about uh, the Iron Age in Wales. Uh, and there's never been a better time, indeed, uh, to look at the Iron Age in Wales. There's so many exciting community projects out there uh, being done. So much new information uh, coming out, as we've just seen from Simon's talk as well. Uh, the, uh, the subject of my uh, title, The Hammer Fighters, were in the southern reaches of Ordovican territory here. The Ordovician tribe, Ordovician tribe, was known as the Hammer Fighters. Um, and they stretched from sort of Powys right up to uh, Arari, Snowdonia. And I think the only uh, location uh, where we have the Ordovician name uh, preserved in Wales is on this uh, standing stone with the Roman cremations at its base with a late Roman or early medieval inscription on it, uh, Corbelengi Yakit Ordovus. Corbelengi lies here. He was an Ordovican. Uh, so uh, that preservation of that uh, tribal name uh, into uh, present times. Uh, but I thought what we need to do really is uh, unlock uh, the Iron Age. Uh, it's all around us, but sometimes it's not that easy to see what archaeologists are looking at or getting excited about. Uh, here's a photograph of me standing on uh, the rampart of Tunagai Hill Fort in the Black Mountains in the southern part of Powys. Uh, I'm standing on a, a wonderful tumbled uh, stonewalled rampart which has quarry ditches behind it, would have been topped with a palisade of timbers, uh, had further rock cut ditches outside it as well, beyond uh, the rampart. But if we talk to people uh, walking the hill fort or uh, looking at uh, people talking to people on site tours, uh, this sometimes could look like a hedge bank or even just topography, really. It's not like obvious sometimes to people that we're looking at ruined, collapsed 2000 year old uh, defenses. And indeed, you know, we still find those uh, some of the same myths, some of the same questions about the Iron Age are still pervading today, uh, still in our schools as well. You know, whether prehistoric Wales was wild and wooded, people were cowering on hilltops above a forested land. Uh, we actually know that uh, the Iron Age landscape was very well farmed, very well divided into territories, with a similar woodland pattern as we have today in parts of Wales in the Roman period. Uh, you know, this idea of living in an exposed and difficult location on a hilltop, people always want to know where people were getting water from as well on these hilltops. The Willoughby Gardener answered that in 1926 and just said you had to walk for it. You know, that's what people in Africa and India did. It will send the children to walk seven miles to get water if you needed it. Uh, an idea still in uh, school curricula today, actually, that the Celts from Europe, the intelligent Celts from Europe arrived on Welsh shores and introduced the ideas of hill forts to the locals, which is a bit of a worry. That's an invasion theory from the 1930s and 1940s, uh, which was dispelled in the 50s and 60s. So lots of ideas out there about what the Iron Age is uh, and what it was. Now, I think we have to uh, still get quite excited about some of the things that we have from Iron Age Wales. Archaeologists get quite complacent sometimes, sites they've known about for years, and they don't occasion much interest nowadays. But we have to go back and look at them afresh. One of these is the Crowquest hut settlement in Snowdonia, uh, excavated over 14 years by Peter Crew from the Snowdonia National Park. Uh, now, this is lies in the middle of nowhere near Charles Funneth. Uh, it's about a group of about five or six roundhouses. It's not a protected site, it's not a guardianship monument, but the huts have been consolidated by the National Park. There's a good half an hour walk in from the nearest lane, uh, but it faces this mountain gap in the Rinogi of the range, the Rinogs on the west coast there. Now, this is used. This is a place where iron was being produced in the last couple of centuries BC and into the early Roman period. An incredible place. Uh, the workers in this farming and industrial settlement uh, were blending uh, ore with charcoal in clay furnaces fired up to 1200 degrees centigrade, producing bloom iron, which had to be then repeatedly hammered and reheated on anvil stones, banging that out. Uh, and Hut H here in the foreground, used for about 500 years, had a ton of iron slag outside when it was excavated. And the anvil stone that they were working the iron on is still there inside the roundhouse. That's the Iron Age anvil stone. And this is producing bar iron for the production of the artifacts that we see in the museums of Wales today. 
And then we have the Capel Garmin Fire Dog, found in the 19th century near Better Sequoid, one of a pair which would have hung a cauldron or something over, over a fire or a half. This is a, probably a votive deposit found on its side with stones at each end. And it depicts uh, twin bull-headed mounts on uh, the fire dog here, but they blend animal imagery. They blend an equestrian plaited mane with a bull's head, the only one in Britain to do so. So a magical, uh, incredible artifact. And Peter Crew reckoned it took three and a half person years to produce smelt, to produce the iron for this and to manufacture and to do the forging on this piece. So some remarkable things out there. More things to get excited about as well. You know, the, uh, on the left, we have the uh, partially clad students of Cardiff University donning uh, the Sinkerigbach gang chain, which uh, ru rung together the necks of five unwilling victims. This was discovered in 1942 in Sinkerigbach votive deposit on Western Anglesey during the construction of an American air base. And this is a 2,200 year old piece of iron. And when it was discovered, it had been being used by tractors to pull lorries out of the mud on the airbase. So it's actually being used as a chain to pull vehicles. So whoever made that in the Iron Age had done a pretty good job on it, really. So incredible uh, tenacity behind some of these old artifacts. And the Lesser Garth uh, Terret Ring from South Wales down near Castell Cork, a large rain guide for a chariot about this size, an incredible piece of a bling, really, for the front of a chariot. This would have been shining like gold, polished bronze originally, uh, and very much like a sort of Rolls Royce hood ornament almost on the front of a chariot. These chariots were fast, flighty uh, uh, machines, and we now have one excavated in South Pembrokeshire in 2018. So some incredible treasures out there. And indeed, in Wales, uh, there's no better place to connect with the past when we're looking at our hill forts. We have some very, very large hill forts on the borders, uh, some enormous sites, but we also have a range of these smaller family type hill forts where you can see the hand of the builders at work, the decisions people have taken when they've been baking ramparts or creating ditches. And sites like this, Pragadinas in Dafranar Didwi in Western Merionth, where we have the rampart walling preserved here from about two and a half thousand years ago, but actually uh, the tiny spools of stone uh, tucked into the wall here, the snakes to make up that wall, uh, and you can imagine those being put in by the builders uh, all those years ago in the Iron Age. So it's very much a case that we can see the technology these people were using uh, to uh, develop these forts. So in terms of the chronology, we have a long history of hill fort building in Wales. Uh, some of our earliest in this part of Wales particularly date back to the late Bronze Age. So we have the creation of monuments like the Brython Hill Fort, which were in Brendinas back in the late Bronze Age period. We have a collapse of the climate at the end of the late Bronze Age, and then a recovery into this earliest Iron Age period, uh, where we have the creation of some very early hill forts. And then a development of expansion of settlement, uh, potentially tensions in the valleys, people being forced down from upland farms and having to defend their territory and claim their territory. But it's a complex picture, still not fully agreed by archeologists. But the very interesting section that we have in Wales, which is fairly unique to us here in the West, is this latest Iron Age and Roman campaigning period. So we have this sort of, uh, the, the sort of pres the pres preservation of Iron Age culture, even during the Roman conquest. So the Romans land on the shores of Kent at AD 43, but they have a 25 to 30 year battle to win this part of Western Wales. Uh, the tribes are very tenacious, the Romans come and they go again. Uh, so we have this enduring uh, culture uh, just to the very last point when Agricola pushes through in AD 78 uh, and conquers central and northwest Wales. And it's from this critical period we're seeing a lot of the hoarding of material. Uh, those terret rings, the Seven Sisters hoard of chariot gear. And it's thought to be, I think I'm current in, in saying this, that the, that the chariot burial in South Pembrokeshire seems to also be from this period. So it's when your world is collapsing, your, your world is coming to an end, and you're doing anything you can to preserve uh, your culture in the face of radical change. So it's a busy landscape in Iron Age Wales. We have around 800 hill forts, true hill forts, but uh, nearly 2,000 
strongly defended hill forts and defended enclosures in Wales. Uh, you can see the pockets of settlement around the peripheries and around the borders. Uh, fewer settlements in, up in the uplands, or the bare uplands of central Wales. But I think it's a regional picture. We can't expect the Iron Age societies that we have perhaps uh, down in the South Wales Plain on the Severn Estuary or around Brecon in South Powys to be exactly the same as what was going on the Sleen Peninsula or Anglesey. We have regional patterns of settlement and then connectivity both from the sea and over the mountain barrier. Coastal promontory forts are also interesting in Wales. We have uh, over 100 of these, uh, nearly 60 in coastal Pembrokeshire. And these may be something of a cultural development as well. It's not just having the topography suitable for a coastal promontory fort, because you have plenty of good coastal terrain in Anglesey, but a handful of coastal sites. And it may be the existence of Sling Kerrig back there on the coast, this votive site, that prohibited or precluded the construction of coastal sites around it. Pembrokeshire seems to fall in with trends in Cornwall and Waterford and Wexford. Uh, so there seems to be something different going on here in the settlement of the coast. So what is a hill fort? It's a difficult question. I may not answer it today, unfortunately. We have very large commanding defensive sites like Kevin Carneth on the Severn Estuary at Sandinum. A long lived site, multiply defended and developed, uh, with maybe later phases on the top, perhaps early medieval or medieval constructions on top. An enormously complicated north gate way here, uh, not really studied in any detail, Kevin Carneth. We can see on the left, Tree Cary Hill Fort on the Sleen Peninsula, what you may think is an archetypal hill fort. It's got double, uh, well, single, great single rampart, double gateways on the left with a zigzag trackway uh, sort of baffled between those gateways coming in. An interior crowded with roundhouses and huts, but not always as, as it seems. You have about 15 Iron Age roundhouses, and then in the Romano British period, an explosion of huts, corbelled buildings, small hovels uh, crammed together in this very, very uncomfortable living. And you can see even you don't actually have any houses inside of the two main gates. You have empty areas. So what's actually happening in Tricaria in the Romano British period is anything but settled. Closer to here, in, uh, closer to Newtown and Thistle, we have smaller lowland enclosures and massive lowland uh, crop marks. The Ordnance Survey names as a settlement, which I never found, never found very con sort of satisfactory learning about the Iron Age as a teenager. And actually, you've got a very heavily defended small uh, settlement here with quite a prestigious uh, rectangular front to it by, by the main gate. And then you have more mysterious sites, Carn Gork in the Western Brecon Beacons. Two and a half kilometers of scree rampart enclosing an empty valley essentially so was this more of a trading settlement uh, or a meeting place at key times of year rather than a packed village or town as we have with tricary so a huge variation in sites i think we always have to go back to the antiquarians the pioneers of our discipline i think there's a huge amount to be learned from them as well Willoughby Gardner, who I've mentioned just now, in his presidential address in 1926, if you haven't read that about the North Wales hill forts, it's a stunning piece of writing. He writes about the Cluidian hill forts, writes about water supply, defensive technology, the angles of, of ramparts, a slingshot and spears, a really good piece of work. And he says, you know, where, where history fails, archaeology takes us back. It's a really perceptive bit of writing. In the late 19th century, we developed from sketch plans of Barnwell there, of St. David's Coastal Promontory Fort on the left, uh, to pencil sketches by Christiansen of 1897 when he visited Tricary and said he'd done a reasonable job um, sketching with his rude drawings, but hopefully somebody might go back with more skill or perhaps even a camera. Um, so these sort of gentlemen visitors, these antiquarians, and then along came Sabine Baring Gould, Reverend Sabine Baring Gould and Robert Bernard in the 19th century from the Dartmoor Exploration Committee to try and date stone forts, uh, digging at St. David's Head, Royal Tregarn, and Tricary. And I put this up because this is uh, Sabine Baring Gould's survey of Royal Tregarn and the Priscelli Hills of Pembrokeshire of 1899. You can see the main ramparts, the annex, and the three cairns on the top. This is the Royal Commission's photogrammetric and uh, topographic survey in 1988. And there's not much between them in terms of plan accuracy. Uh, these people knew what they're doing and, and 
Baring Gould's articles are full of insistence of quality and standards that he's instilling on his dig to try and dig in a more scientific fashion. Today, it's a, it's a really good time to look at Hill Forts. We've got many community projects going on, not only projects like uh, CPAT's Beacon Ring work of a couple of years back. Uh, we've got work at Aberystwyth at the moment, but Pendinus, a lottery funded project. Look at Pendinus here. You see a new drone survey, drone photogrammetry. It was completed in April this year. And really inspirational projects like the Kai Heritage Project at Ely and Cardiff. If you're ever down in Cardiff, follow the brown signs to the uh, community centre and walks up to the hill fort. Uh, you know, they've got a hill fort themed play area, a hill fort themed community centre. Ten years of fundraising and excavations. It's been incredible. And of course, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of LIDAR today as well. LIDAR, laser scanning, airborne laser scanning, an amazing technology where you can take wooded monuments like Kairai Hill Fort here, strip it back to the computer model, and then take all the vegetation and woodland away to reveal those hidden earthworks. And we're discovering many new sites now that we've got Welsh government funded LIDAR for the whole of Wales. So who were the people of Iron Age Wales? And we have this mental image of a, a sort of a rough, dark, curly-haired individual uh, that you may not want to meet on a dark night. Uh, and a lot of that comes from Tacitus, the Roman historian, in his uh, sort of eulogy of his father-in-law Agricola, where he writes of the Silures tribe of southern Wales, Brecon, uh, Gwent, uh, sort of Vale of Morgan. The swarthy faces and their curly hair suggest they came from Spain, and this is pervaded. But with a portable antiquities scheme, particularly, we're getting more faces from the Iron Age now. It's interesting. We have on the left one of the plaques from Talasin or Cadaridris. This is probably a godlike face. It's two opposing heads uh, found on a, a plaque, which may have mounted on a casket or a chariot. But you see there the hair on the individual is combed neatly back, very neatly combed back. And a more recent find of a sword pommel from Somerset potentially a Juro Triggies warrior, has this very same smart hair drawn back. But then in Tau Garth, on a scabbard shape, uh, handed in uh, about four or five years ago, uh, we have a very noble individual with long flowing hair, apparently clean shaven, with a quizzical look on their face. And then some of you will know this is excavated at Carly and Barracks in 2010, the fragment of potentially uh, a sort of celebratory monument within the fortress, thought to show a a captured Silurian warrior with their hands tied behind their back, looking very sorry for themselves. So we're beginning to get more a sight on the faces of the people who built these forts. There's still debate about what sort of society we had in Wales. Uh, the Romans tell us about a stratified hierarchies of kings and retainers, and this was Cunliffe's model after Danbury in the 1960s and 70s, which he threw open to debate. Um, so do we have these kingly residences with the vassal farms paying tax to the leader? Perhaps, though younger researchers now, uh, particularly Cardiff, Ollie Davis, have purported sort of the communities of egalitarian builders. So this, this Amish model of a barn raising. So one family can't build a fort all by themselves. So they call in 25 neighbors on a sort of network of gifts and exchange. And then you can then call those people back to help you when you need to. Or my favourite model for some of Wales is this rather competitive, vociferous feuding chieftains who rise and fall every 10 or 15 years, uh, get their power base made and then collapse and somebody else takes over. And perhaps we had all mixes of these from Cardiff uh, to sort of Newtown to Anglesey to Pembrokeshire. And we have amazing symbols of wealth, apparent symbols of wealth. It's the Boverton neck collar, potentially an early Roman uh, collar found in near Santuic Major in 2005 in a burial. But do these incredible neck rings, do they symbolize personal wealth? Or is it like a sort of marial chain, a chain of a badge of office for the person who wore it? We now know that Wales is interconnected. Uh, it faced an international seaway, a very busy seaway. Uh, in Iron Age times. Uh, so although the west coast of Wales is fairly remote nowadays from the sort of hubs, the busy hubs of Cardiff uh, and sort of England and London, actually in the Iron Age, the tribes here would have been well connected uh, to uh, the wider parts of Europe. 
uh, and the Mediterranean. These are the, some of the tribal names that the Romans left to us, the Gangani or the Vipis. The voyage of Pythias uh, has sort of fallen out of favor. Canlis written about him more recently. This uh, Greek out of Massilla in 340 BC, circumnavigating Britain and meeting the locals in Cornwall to trade tin. The Britanni people of Britannia, as he recorded it, he named Mona, Anglesey. Um, and it's from his writing and this Greek record of the Britanni people that we have the word Britannia now. And still the Welsh word for Britain, Prydine, takes that Greek form with a P. But we have tantalizing evidence of Mediterranean contact. An anchor stock found at Paul Thelen off Bardsey, dating around 100, 150 BC, of a, a trading vessel potentially looking for metal, or very likely looking for metal, with a game of lucky knuckle bones cast into the anchor stock there. Obviously didn't do them any favours. Uh, so now when we reconstruct promontory forts, we can begin to bring this international sort of perspective into it. Here we have Strabo writing 7 BC, probably quoting Tithius, uh, Pythias's book, that Britannia bears grain, cattle, gold, silver, and iron. And we know this is Paul's in the Simon's talk, as all we know, by the 60s and 70s, the Romans in Wales were extracting lead from lead mines of the Declangi tribe up in northeast Wales. So surely those mines must have been open before the conquest. This is a, a lead pig from AD 74 there. And we've just recently reconstructed this year a coastal promontory fort near St. David's based on some new excavations there. And we're showing copper miners working the cliffs here because we've got copper on site and a Mediterranean vessel visiting that promontory fort as well. So it's not an insular society, it's a uh, well-connected uh, society, uh, 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 well-connected with an international perspective, international contacts. So looking at hill forts, this is my sort of version of a sort of geography O-level uh, diagram. It's rather large to be seen like this, but you know, we, we have to sort of convey the idea that what we're seeing today, the place of walking our dogs, having picnics, uh, these ruins of 2000 year old buildings. The gateways have collapsed, the stone walling you may be able to see through the soil. Uh, the houses have gone, but as we saw in Paul's talk this morning, we have platforms dug into the hill slope showing the positions of houses. And even rocks and rock outcrops within them are quite interesting places. This is where people would have sat and worked or tr done activities a couple of thousand years ago in the Iron Age. So you must use your imagination when you're visiting uh, these sites today. Hillfort building would have been a major task, and I don't think we still quite grasp the physical exertion, the civil engineering effort behind the construction of some of the larger hillforts. This is an imagined scene of the construction of a small hillfort. And even before you began construction, you would need to be sourcing your timber. Either you had to own the woodland, or you had to know somebody who did, the managed woodland, uh, or you had to start calling in your favours uh, to get the construction work underway. Professor Bill Manning worked out you need around a thousand trees per enclosed hectare of fort, both for the uh, defences but also timber bracing if you're using it inside the, the ramparts. So an enormous timber component has to be felled and brought to site and, and worked as well. And digging rock is, is a key problem as, as Simon was saying. Uh, we have antler picks and stone walls from Iron Age ditches. Uh, otherwise, how else were they breaking the rock? Were they using fire setting still? Were they wedging with, with water and wooden wedges? Uh, and actually, we found a hafted pebble in Pendinus Hill Fort this April. I think one of the first from a hill fort, showing the persistence of Bronze Age digging technology uh, on these, these sites. Uh, and, and we have good evidence from Cassie at least particularly that the gateways may have been architect designs and, 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 and built by specialists or designed by specialists. But signs of building technology going on, uh, Crygoderian, Bird's Rock, we have a massive small sort of grape shop behind the collapsed rampart wall. This represents thousands of basket loads of material, small stones brought in from the surrounding hillside to backfill the rampart wall. And Kyle Drury, a break in gang work between larger boulders here and smaller stones here, quite an interface between two work gangs uh, building there. Undoubtedly building on hilltops, it states the obvious, but it gave you uh, a visual command of your surrounding territory. It gave you power. You stand at the top of the Brython Hill Fort today on a clear day, you've got a view for 60 miles in any direction. 
you can see your livestock, you can see your people, you can see approaching people, but also you have a, a view of uh, routeways through the landscape, uh, your neighbours in distant hills with smoke rising, and you can also see the weather approaching, approaching storms. Moel Haravig commands the North Wales coast from Liverpool Bay round to the Great Orme, visually. And Crager of Darren here on the Dasani Valley occupies this iconic leaning crag right at the top of that. And navigating to these places would have been easier to find these hills in wooded landscapes potentially, or if you're going to, to meet people, to gather, to trade. Uh, Kate Waddington calls these high hill forts controlling entities in the landscape. And many of these hill forts contain earlier monuments, Bronze Age burial cairns, particularly uh, in many sites. And these are often revered and preserved despite the need for building material. Uh, so if Royal Dragan, the Preseli Hills has three high cairns on the summit, which were not touched during the construction of the scree ramparts. And further surface evidence suggests these were enclosed within a fenced enclosure within the hill fort. But this is interesting. They were obviously revered and sacred to people in the landscape. And the hill fort builders acquired this new or this old ancestral power. But something changed when the hill fort was constructed. It was suddenly closed off behind a barrier, behind a new private world that had been created. So that uh, old landscape had been owned and acquired by a new charismatic leader. It's an interesting change, really. And one would have had the stored grain wealth of the, of the community on show as well in these raised uh, granaries throughout the interior. So we had varied defenses uh, at our hill forts, too many to talk about today. Uh, but we have some impressive survivals. If you go to Clyde Drurin up on the, uh, on the sort of uh, up near Shangotlin there, we still have a standing uh, dry stone wall of the hill fort in places where it was cleared to be viewed by antiquarians. And a reconstruction gives us a very impressive stepped rampart, similar to many of the other hill forts of North Wales. In some parts of Wales, we have Chivot de Fries, these curtains of upright stones around the forts thought to have dissuaded attack on horseback. This is Carnalu in the Preseli Hills, where you can see the surrounding moorland is picked clean of small stones, and they've been put into this defensive curtain around the outcrop, penetrated by an entrance gap. Uh, but look here, we've got this Castro in North Galicia, in North Spain, which has a Chivo de Fries around a small outcrop fort, very similar design to Carnalu and some of the forts we have in Western Wales. So we've undoubtedly got trading links and, and, and links between people on the West Coast here. And we have uh, the, the aspect of thorn hedging or thorny defences potentially. This is the Omo Valley in Ethiopia, a long way from Wales. Uh, but some societies use thorn hedging as a very, very strong barrier to keep people out. It was used in colonial times in India and the West Indies as well. So if you augmented a, a defence like this with thorns, there is no way anybody can get through that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lost element that we may have had in our Iron Age hill forts in Wales. But take this above the sort of practical necessities of the enclosure. We have issues now like monumentality, uh, the psychology of warfare, where you attempt to make your hill fort look more impressive than it actually was. If you can prevent attack on your fort because it looks too terrifying, then all the better. People won't even, even bother to attack your, your, your site. And we have, in places like West, West Wales, Ceredigion, some very, very small hill forts. There's Castec or Tregaron, a tiny fort enclosing about a hectare or a hectare and a half, which has ramparts, five metre tall ramparts, which are steeper than the angle of Maiden Castle in Dorset. So everything has been put into the front door, potentially as a sort of cultural and architectural symbolism, but also to warn people off. And at Guy of Owen Gillsfield, we have you know, under the woods there, we have a, an incredible terraced stepped hill fort developed far above and beyond what you need for a practical enclosure with this triple terraced uh, sort of facade looking out over Dufferin Maivod, the Vernry Valley, and probably acting as a real symbol over the surrounding landscape of the people who live there. Sites like Pellet Creek Hill Fort as well, you don't really need too much help to make this look terrifying because it's surrounded by four or five ramparts, but there are sophisticated elements within that. But the interesting thing 
uh, Pelle Prig and other thoughts is we seem to have preserved a correct path of approach, a respectful way to approach the hill fort. A uh, deeply worn hollowway winds its way towards the hill fort. We were there a couple of weeks ago with the campings. This hollowway is shoulder deep approaching the fort. It comes up to the fort and then runs left along the front of it and then kinks back just outside the entrance. So it's controlling your path of approach to the final sort of destination, the gateway. I've got an eye on time here, Paul. I don't know how much leeway I've got starting 10 minutes late, but we'll, we'll wrap it up, we'll wrap it up. Um, but the gateways, you know, the gateways were incredibly impressive places in hill forts. This is the destination of everybody heading to the site. Though, you know, with people out in the fields tending sheep, from a couple of miles out, people would have known you were on your way if you were an unwelcome visitor. From 60 meters out, you become vulnerable to slingshot, which could fracture your skull if you weren't expected. Uh, and then coming close in, you're coming very close to this, this portal, which separates the public world of the farming, the open landscape, from the very private world of the Hillfort interior. It's difficult to get a really good reconstruction of a good Hillfort gateway. I had to go to um, Old Sarum for this one. Um, I think it's Ivan Lapper. Uh, but it shows the sort of votive totems outside the gateway, the angry people on top with carnices, these war trumpets, uh, banging their shields with their swords. Uh, and, you know, it sounds glib, but, you know, Harold Mighton, uh, Professor Harold Mighton, we don't cast it here, please, sort of parallels these gateways almost with airport customs. It, it, you know, a terror, actual terror of going into this dark passageway lined with the votive offerings to the chief or leader. Uh, underneath this wooden bridge over which you have clattering footsteps and so on. And still that, you know, are you going to be allowed in or not before you pierce that interior into this private world? It's a really interesting sort of portal. But many crop mark enclosures in, in West Wales and Montgomeryshire show 40, 50, 60 metre long entrances, uh, is antenna entrances, banjo enclosures to these forts. And, and you don't see these reconstructed nowadays. You have reconstructed Celtic villages, but not these extraordinary, strange places that were the way people just lived and farmed in the early days. Perhaps just a good way to get livestock in, but perhaps there's something more to it than that. Uh, but above monumentality, above awe and shock and spectacle, you have the real military areas to some of these forts, particularly on the borderlands. A guy of our Gillsfield, the final entrance way here in this, this great survey by Louise Barker. This, this killing zone of about 40 or 50 metres in between the rampart sides. If you are friends, if you're coming for a wedding, great, because this is enormously impressive and you're full of respect and awe for the leader who's built this. But if you're attacking, you have absolutely no chance unless, of course, you're Romans and you have your shields locked over your head which is probably one of the few ways they began to break down these great power bases of the borders. Yeah, two seconds. Um, I'm almost there. Um, the weaponry of, of the Iron Age is interesting. Uh, we have this sort of 40-year-old gentleman from Andover, who's one of the few actual extant Iron Age warriors reconstructed to see. And he's an amalgam of finds, but he has a bronze... A uh, boar on his helmet. We have one from Guy of Al, we have one from Ga Gower. So some elements of, of, of his outfits are, are fairly good. Um, slingshot would have been the common cheap weapon of most people in hill forts. Uh, but it's difficult to find good illustrations of our Welsh weapons. So I put this together for the book. And this is a North Wales warrior. And look at these regional shield designs. This Philip Macdonald first wrote about this, I think, some years ago. Well, actually, earlier people did as well. But we have the Moraharadig shield with his bracketed boss. And then we have the Talasin shield from Cader Idris, the same. And a votive shield from near Barmouth found in 2001, which has elements of the whole heroic design on the centre of it, but this bracketed boss as well. So these are your, these are your North Wales shields. And the warrior here holds a, the, one of the swords from Sling Carrick back, nearly a metre long, with drag on the ground if you're six foot tall, and a 75 centimetre long uh, spear, so a long, sharp, uh, vicious spear. So, uh, you know, some really interesting weapons that we have from this time. Of course, everything changed when the Romans uh, came and had a sort of 30 year battle to win Wales. Uh, Tacitus records the struggle of the Silures, which I won't go into any detail now. 
Uh, but, you know, again, we're quite complacent about Tacitus. It's a narrative written 40 or 50 years after the event to be declaimed as a sort of celebratory piece of text. But there's still interesting things in it. You know, the Roman commander had enraged the Silures because he said they should be utterly exterminated. He has an incredibly strong narrative from this time of conquest. The mounted auxiliaries, more lightly armed than the legionaries here, and then the foundation after the AD 70s of Roman forts, like that of Caius Seuss here, with its double ditches, harsh marks of uh, streets between the barrack buildings there as well. Uh, so, you know, if you imagine today, if you imagine uh, Caius Seuss up the road, we had a thousand uh, hostile soldiers of an invading force, and another thousand settling quickly at Forden near Montgomery. It's quite intimidating, drawing food from all the farms of the surrounding landscape every day. Uh, trying to reach a negotiated peace with leaders on horseback, a very, very uh, fragile time in, in sort of Welsh history. Um, and of course, we're very close on the seven here, either at Llandinum, at Kevin Carnedd, or the Brythin, or at Llanaman Hill, to the potential place where Caraticus, uh, Caradoc, had his last stand in AD 50, uh, which Tacitus describes. Um, and again, you know, full of caveats, this writing, this is. This is long after the event, and I, I'm not sure, I've talked to Jeff Davis about it, I'm not sure who Tacitus was talking to, to get his, his annals together, his histories. So it may be a generic description of a battle, but if you haven't read it, it's very well worth getting it in the Penguin uh, sort of uh, text, basically. Because here we see, this is a picture from the, the, the Eagle, the Hollywood film, which I always think is quite a good grubby recreation of what could have been going on in, in Roman mid Wales. Um, and we see here, Caraticus drawing together the Ordovices and the Silurians, chose a place on steep hills over a river and piled stones into a kind of rampart uh, to see off this Roman uh, attack by Astorius Scapula, uh, the sort of long suffering uh, governor. And the chieftains went round their men, encouraging them and heartening them to be optimistic. And the Romans crossed the river, but then were driven back by a hail of missiles, so potentially slingshot and spears, so they became off worse in wounds and casualties, so they bloodied the Romans uh, in this first clash. And then we read uh, the sort of the terrible sort of reality of it, that under locked shields, the Romans then came back in, uh, and the Roman, the British didn't have any breastplates or armour, uh, so they were either cut down by the swords and spears, the regulars, or succumbed to the auxiliaries, broadswords and pikes. It's a mid-century translation here. But you can see the brutality of that clash. If you didn't work out a peace with the Romans, that, that critical uh, sort of period of 25, 30 years. So really, really interesting text. Last couple of slides, really. Um, so wider questions about Iron Age Wales. We're nowhere near sorting everything out, I don't think, yet. We have incredible sacred places uh, in Wales, two votive lakes at the moment. Thinkerig back, there's RAF Valley where the fast jets take off and land. In 1942, to stabilize the sand dunes over the airport, they dragged peat out of this area and bought out one of Europe's finest collections of uh, late Iron Age weaponry, shield fittings, chariot fittings, swords, and spears. And there's been some more investigation in the early 2000s around here, but what's going on everywhere else is, is the great question. And Sinbao and Rigos. Again, a reservoir drained in the early 20th century, quite by accident, revealed this uh, early Iron Age horde of cauldrons and weapons in the peat. Much of it's probably still lost or, or still in there. Uh, and must, most of this on display in, in St. Bagan's Museum now as well. But it's not enough, really, is it? Two votive lakes found by accident doesn't seem enough uh, to me to complete that Iron Age landscape we have in Wales. What other lakes may we have? The thing Kyle and Cadridges in 1963, a couple of picnickers sat down from St. Baden Bauer and from under a rock noticed some rusty metal and pulled out uh, two shields uh, and a Roman lock and fragments of casket fittings as well. The Tarthing Hall. Uh, <laughs> but do keep an eye out when you're having a picnic in the mountains next time. Uh, but it's under this rock on the path up to this deep mountain lake, which is like Thin Vow, it's sort of cauldron like setting. So, do we have other votive lakes or votive foci? in the Iron Age landscape that we should be concerned about, we should be focusing on. Uh, and the last slide here, really. I think we're getting better now at understanding 
the other worlds involved in Hillfort life, not just the farming, but the sacred, the religious, the burial. The Pembrokeshire chariot uh, discovered in 2018 was from a round burial mound outside of Promontory Fort in Pembrokeshire. And three years of work at Castec Adolig in West Wales, now about to be published in Archaeology of Cambrensis, uh, shows these burial mounds within and around the fort and a series of springs within that fort as well. And this reminds me of Pentra Camp uh, uh, up uh, in uh, near Llanbair Carinian, which I've written about previously, which is we've got a lot of concentric forts in Wales, but Pentra Camp is highly concentric, perfectly built very unusual, an inner bank and an outer bank, and then two flat interspaced banks in the middle, enclosed in this sort of rounded summit. And visiting there a few years ago, I noticed there's a huge spring head just below the fort. Uh, and, you know, this is potentially a really important part of the archaeology of Pentra Camp. We know when the Buckbean Pond was excavated on the Brythin, we found many domestic objects, plates, uh, twines, tools, but also a small sword, wooden sword on display in St. Baggins. Could be a child's toy, but Miranda Green reminds us this is a sort of tradition of votive or miniature weapons and shields that we find from these sort of wetland deposits. So we should be looking more, I think, for some of these more interesting aspects, these votive aspects and sacred aspects of, of Iron Age Wales. So I'll leave you with a nice picture of the Castle Headpiece Roundhouse, showing the sophistication of its construction. And I'm delighted that Sue Wheeler here is from here from Logiston Press today and has brought some books along to sell as well. And Logiston have done a brilliant job getting this, pulling this book together. So I'd like to thank them and many other people. So I hope that's covered most things. Thank you very much indeed to Jochen Vaal.